My parents were married on the 23rd of September in 1939. That was uh, an interesting uh, situation, really. Well, that's a family uh, picture. I believe it just after marriage. They lived, uh, well, in a very large home, really, in the center of Lima. Two years afterward, my, the, my brother Roberto was born. And uh, that's a picture of all four of us. Uh, it was uh, in 1943, after my uh, brother was about a year old. The way I remember my uh, brother is that he was always the one that was mm, attracting all attention. I tended to be more quiet. He was uh, obviously looking for uh, applause most of the time. Both of us went to the same schools. First Inmaculado Corazón and then Santa Maria. Uh, and those are the pictures uh, of both of us, I think. Uh, one of uh, each uh, when we went to Holy Communion, that's about when we were 10. And already uh, in the year 1950, we had moved to this present house where we are right now. And that's, well, a picture that I never had. This was uh, when my uh, brother uh, graduated from uh, school, and that's the, the uh, prom. Uh, well, I don't really know who that girl is <laughs> or what she's doing now. Well, uh, yes, we both went to university right after uh, finishing school. I went to San Marcos to study medicine, and my brother went to uh, Ingeniería to study engineering. He finished school, but at already that time, he was interested also in movies, and he went with the uh, uh, with the team that was making this big movie that was important for Peru, in La Selva No Hay Estrellas, and there are no stars in the, in the jungle. And he became part of the team, really, because he uh, practically took all the, the still uh, pictures that were used in the uh, uh, propaganda for, for this, uh, this movie. He left and he, although he maintained a pretty good contact with uh, my parents uh, through the telephone and with us, and the rest of the family uh, by mail, uh, he never met any of us. I was so blessed to have met Roberto, and it came by accident. Somebody, I was working at Channel 13, an editor who had worked for the series City Arts the season before told me I should not be working for them anymore, that I was better than that. I said, I know, but I just moved back to New York from San Francisco. I need to connect with people. If you have anybody to recommend for me to call for work because the job was going to end, I'm all ears. She said, I actually do have someone in mind for you to call. His name is Roberto Guerra. He's been making a lot of art films. I think he's working on a project right now that you might even might even need help. And she said, so, you know, give him a call. And who knows? If nothing else, maybe you'll fall in love. Well, flash forward, 17 years later, we were still together. So we called her our bruja, our witch. I actually knew, I have to say, I knew the first day I met him that he was such an amazing person, a person of quality, of substance, of achievement, of sensitivity. And I actually knew that I wanted to be with him that very first day. It was a little bit complicated. He was still grieving himself. His uh, first partner and wife, um, Isla Hershon, had died three years earlier of ovarian cancer. He was very bereft. Luckily, he was seeing two other women at the time, so I wasn't the first rebound. And we developed a friendship at first through art and culture. We went to openings, we went to performances, we had meals, we talked. And then finally, it sort of started to migrate into um, a deeper connection and a romantic one. On top of it, the beauty was that we became collaborators. So as I say to people today, in his passing, I lost my best friend, my lover, and my collaborator. The other beautiful thing about Roberto, and I thanked him for being born in Peru, is he's like, it's not my fault. When I first met him, I said, what? You never went back to Peru? You left in the late 60s and you never went back? You have a mother still alive? You've never been to Machu Picchu? Use me as the gringa chick. Let's go. He said, oh, you don't understand. I was raised more in the 19th century. I wasn't estranged from my family, but it was formal. Two military dictatorships and hyperinflation. I wasn't going to go back to live there. Well, okay, but what about a visit? 
oh, it has to be a project. We had made portraits for City Arts in New York Magazine on Channel 13 and won a couple of Emmys. And we had a card about it. We went to a party in Brooklyn. We met a guy from Ireland who wanted to make a documentary about people going to Machu Picchu for the millennium. He saw the card, he learned that was Roberto was from Peru, and he said, I don't have a big budget, but if you would come and be one of my DPs, I will pay for your expenses. Well, that was enough for Roberto said to say, okay, I'm gonna make a trip back to Peru. So that was 1999 to 2000. We were actually in the ruins of Machu Picchu at the turning of the millennium with a ritual with a shaman. That film was made, Cusco 1999. It's not our film, it's by Donald O'Kelleher. But that was the catalyst that got us to go back to Peru for the first time. So then, hey, we're in the neighborhood. We go to Lima. He reconnects with his mom, with his brother. I have work to continue that we started. His legacy is so important to me, so this tribute um, at this Peruvian cinema showcase that we've attended every year is so meaningful, and it's, it's such an honor to present some of his work here um, through this showcase, so I'm delighted about that. So, okay, so we started working together. Roberto lived on Mercer Street in NoHo, and I lived here. I moved to this loft in the Flower District in 1995, and I've lived here ever since. In the spring of 1998, Roberto moved in with me. Roberto came to New York as a young filmmaker from Peru because he wanted to start to work in Cinema Verite. He read about the pioneers, Albert Maisels, Ricky Leacock, D.A. Pennybaker, Robert Drew. He came here as an engineer. He said he corrupted himself to filmmaking from his engineering background, so he wasn't afraid of technology. So when he came, they were working on 16 millimeter sync sound, and he wasn't, a sca he wasn't afraid of the tech. So they all engaged him to work with him. And that's how he came to actually meet Isla through Albert Maisels. And he corrupted her to filmmaking. She was a painter. And they started making films together. They moved to Europe because they realized that the kind of films they were making had much better support in Europe than here. They were mostly interested in making portraits of artists and cultural people. Um, one of their very first films was on Oskar Kokoschka, the, the German painter Isla had studied with him. Um, one film that hopefully will now come out into the world, in 1970 they made a film on Henri Langlois, the founder of the Cinémathèque Française in Paris. It's an incredible film, it never had distribution. The Cinémathèque Française has just recently restored the film because this is the centenary of Henri Langlois' birth. I went to Paris for the screening, I came back with the digital restoration, and I'm going to work with a sales agent to put that film out into the world. It's an incredible film. Here is a man, a Frenchman, a man of destiny, born to do one thing. Nothing in life means anything to Henri Langlois but films and the preservation of films. He was one of the first to realize that it was an art form because we're only taking our first baby steps in a new language. And certainly, if it's preserved, like Giotto's painting, we will have to thank Henri Langlois. Certainly, of all the men I've ever met in the world, Henri Langlois is the most dedicated to the preservation of films. He has no money. He has very little power. He's from a small country as the world goes. In spite of that, he's managed through his dedication. I think he would die for the films he's uh, collected. And they are the largest uh, film collection in the world. And mankind, if it's ever to learn from its mistakes by seeing how they keep making them over and over again, it will be thanks to his work and to his museum, the Cinémathèque Française. And he was joined by Mary Marison, and together they have developed the Cinémathèque of Paris, which is today the biggest collection of old movies. And um, they have now 60,000 movies, which is the 
biggest amount as in New York. I hear you have 6,000 and uh, in Russia 15,000 pictures in their old uh, museums. When I met him, and that was in 41, in uh, the middle of the Nazi occupation, uh, uh, there was a very slim, uh, hungry-looking young man uh, who was living with his mother in a very, very small apartment, Rue Troyon, I don't know if, you, if it took you there, and who was organizing projection of um, forbidden films. power but he's uh, strange I mean he knows he can back on people everywhere and there, there were so many people important people who cared about him and the cinematic that it was quite frightening for the people of the government of course So they made a number of films. Frida Kahlo, they made the first film on her before she was canonized. Um, they had pitched the idea and to uh, European funders and television stations, and they were like, what? A female artist and Mexican? Eh, I don't think so. Then all of a sudden, a German station called them up and said, we need the film on Frida Kahlo. There was going to be an exhibit, and then they wanted it. So, so that film came out. In 1934, Rivera had an affair with Frida's sister, Christina. He painted Christina in a fresco in the National Palace. Her eyes have that blank, orgasmic expression that Rivera reserved for women with whom he was sexually infatuated. When Frida learned of Diego and Christina's betrayal, she wrote, I am in such a state of sadness, boredom, etc., that I can't even do a drawing. The situation with Diego is worse each day. Frida painted almost nothing during the period when Rivera was involved with Cristina. They continued to make films on creative people. They made a portrait of Coco Chanel. They made um, a three-part series on, it's called The Beauty Queens, on Helena Rubinstein, Estee Lauder, and Elizabeth Arden. They made a six-part series on design, called By Design. It included portraits of Richard Sapper, Milton Glaser, Karl Lagerfeld, Elliot Erwitt, Ben and Jane Thompson, and Lella and Massimo Vignelli. I set the fashion for a quarter century, said Coco Chanel. Why? Because I knew how to express my own time. My time was ready for me, waiting. All I had to do was come on the scene. Fashion is a reflection of a period, she said. It is always of the time in which you live. Karl Lagerfeld, who designs today for the House of Chanel, has said, Coco Chanel's genius was in doing the right thing at the right time. She became a symbol for an entire period. Chanel survived everybody. She was around to, to repeat the name endlessly, longer than everybody else. She became the kind of guardian of her own image of the past. It was quite strong, and she made a kind of legion out of herself. Si je coupais mes cheveux, on coupait les cheveux. Si je ne sais pas, je m'habillais un peu plus court, tout le monde se faisait des robes un peu plus courtes. C'est pas moi qui ai inventé ça. Je m'habillais pour moi. Je m'habille pour moi d'abord. D'ailleurs, quand je travaille, je regarde une robe et je me dis est-ce que tu porterais ça Quand je me dis non, je ne le porterai pas, alors je ne fais pas. The phenomenal success of the fashions and perfume bearing her name had made Chanel a wealthy woman. Her response Money for me has never been anything but the sound of independence. 
But such feelings did not keep her from falling in love with the richest man in England, Hugh Richard Arthur Grosvenor, better known as Ben Dor, the second Duke of Westminster. Three years later, with war imminent, Chanel closed down the fashion house which she had founded, putting thousands of employees out of work. Politicians, trade union leaders, and especially her customers, implored her to stay open. This is no time for fashion, she said. Chanel lived in a room at the Ritz Hotel for the duration of the war. Although the Nazis requisitioned the hotel in 1940, Chanel was not forced to leave. She had become the lover of a high-ranking German officer. In 1944, when de Gaulle and his free French troops marched into Paris, it was clear to Chanel that she should leave France. Many years later, probably over 30 years, to Roberto and I making a newer film on the Vignellis that's actually out in distribution right now. Um, I'm very thrilled that that film was done and released while Roberto was first still well, and then we had a theatrical release last October 2013 at the IFC. It got a good review in the New York Times. And as he was sick and was declining in health, he knew this was happening. He knew it was getting out into the world. And Roberto realized he actually wanted to start making films in Peru as well. That's where he came from. That's where he started filmmaking. And he wanted, why not? We had the equipment. So we started some projects there. And those are some of the projects I actually still have to finish. It's a way for me to still collaborate with Roberto. One is called Beauty, Be Behi Beauty Behind Bars. Um, it's about mostly foreign women who go to Peru because they think they're going to get a quick way to make money by smuggling cocaine out. They get caught, they get incarcerated, and they had a beauty pageant in the prison. So that needs to be finished. Most of the footage is shot. After seeing it, I went to my studio and I had this beautiful stone, which I had for a couple of years already. Because I live with my stones before I work them, you see. But with this one, I wanted to do really something special. So I stood in front of that stone and the, the sentence formed, the eye that cries. And immediately I knew that she would be like a mother earth crying over what her children do one to the other. So I started to work on the sculpture and then gradually I was sure that the names of the known victims should be included. And I didn't know what form to choose for that. And then I came upon the labyrinth which is the labyrinth of Chartres, which is a very old labyrinth also. Also related to Mother Earth, to feminine force, to a stone, to a dolmen. And the labyrinth is a very magical form which um, raises also a special energy and it grabs you at levels which you don't control. connected with some very interesting creative people there, um, two who are not Peruvians, but they might as well be. They've lived there for many, many years, Lika Mutal and Ham Cloutier. Why do two Dutch artists choose to stay in Peru? If none of you have ever been to Peru, go. It's an amazing place. Um, the sensibility is different. The living indigenous culture that intertwines with 21st century globalism is really remarkable and something we don't feel here. Roberto was in amazing health. He was he turned 71 in May of 2013. But around that time he was starting to he had had a clean colonoscopy in April of that year. But he was starting to have weird symptoms and not feeling so well. And we had follow-up tests and everything was checking out okay. And um, so his brother, Umberto, had asked us to go to Peru uh, for about five weeks in uh, late June and July. So we went off to Peru. He was still feeling like he had this abdominal, intestinal issues that was bothering him. We started having tests down there, um, tests to the point that uh, they said, you know what, something's going on, we don't know what it is, you don't have health insurance here, you have great medical care in New York, I think you probably need to go back sooner than you were planning. So we came back to New York two weeks earlier, started having tests, 
and um, soon thereafter, Roberto was in the hospital because he had an obstruction. They did a surgical colonoscopy and put in a stent to bypass the obstruction and then started to test the pathology. At first they thought it was rectal cancer. God wishes it had been. He would probably still be with us here. It turned out, unfortunately, the markers weren't marking for rectal cancer. They were marking for um, either stomach or pancreatic cancer. We were still going to have the surgery for the other thing, and then the last minute NYU said, game change, we just put his case before the tumor board, and I'm sorry to say the verdict is pancreatic cancer. So the shift from rectal cancer to pancreatic cancer was pretty dramatic. They told us from the get-go that it was um, incurable. It was stage 4 metastasized. That's the problem with pancreatic cancer. It hides in your body, and by the time it's discovered, it's usually too late. Friends came. He was holding court. He was... The glass was half full, even with him facing his impermanence, the fact that he was not going to live. He was on fire. He was creative. He was filled with joy. He said, I've had, a, he, I've had a good life. I wish I was going to be around longer, but one per customer. I've, I've you know, been aligned with my life purpose. I've done what I wanted to do. Um, he just was, he was a Buddha. He, he taught us all so much about how to face. Día, yo comp compro La República, el periódico, y un día lo abro y veo fallecimiento de Roberto Guerra, ¿no? Me parecía una cosa, pero muy sorprendente para mí. Le enseño a mi mujer y ella lo adoraba porque le parecía así en esa en calle, aquella época un cuerazo lo adoraba a Roberto. Lo conocimos ahí en esa empresa nova. Ella iba y lo veía, lo conocía. Y eso fue un poco la Eh, un golpe muy fuerte para nosotros, de todas maneras. Fue una cosa así, muy sorprendente, una cosa que no te esperas, ¿no? Abres el periódico, ves un amigo que, que ha muerto joven, ¿no? He uh, and Cassie left uh, during July, and uh, were, uh, went to New York, the diagnosis of the uh, uh, pancreatic cancer was made until January 10 when he died. We tried to maintain contact. We were able to use Skype for uh, talking over that system. But uh, there were differences then. He uh, was very clearly deteriorating. And although that, well, it's a very sad period, it also helped in, in us becoming more brothers than before. Not much I can say after that. One of the most amazing things he said close to his passing was, I need to celebrate that I'm soon going to break into cellular pieces. He was a poet, an artist, a scientist, a Renaissance man. I miss him terribly. He was the love of my life. He was my soulmate. I was so blessed to have him in my life. I miss him so much. But I carry him with me. He's right here in my locket.